questions left over from last time? All right, so uh, we're going to start off with uh, some of the classic approaches to studying attention. Uh, and now we're talking about the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. So the ways in which we had available to study something like attention, which operates really pretty quickly. So in modern times, it's much easier because we have computers. But uh, back in the 60s, we were left with a few options. And one of the things they were quite interested in was auditory attention. And so uh, we'll start off talking about the what's called dichotic listening task. And then we'll talk about what's called the cocktail party effect, which is uh, one of the areas in which this dichotic listening task was used to investigate. The basic idea behind dichotic listening is you present auditory information via stereo headphones, where you have two separate things going into each ear. Uh, so they might have something, some speech they're following in the left ear, and they're supposed to ignore whatever's happening in the right ear. So they're paying attention to one ear and completely ignoring the other ear. And you can imagine that would be rather annoying and difficult. Uh, but basically this was the idea. So what they would do is they would shadow, that is they would simply repeat back what was occurring in one ear and completely ignore information from the other. What this provided was a way in which you could have information that they would attend to and information that they weren't supposed to be attending to and then you could also then verify by the fact that they were shadowing it that they were, one, paying attention to the message they were supposed to, and then, two, that they were actually genuinely ignoring the other, or see if you could somehow get them to pay attention. So this psychotic listening task looks something like this. They're shadowing this attended input in the left ear, supposed to be ignoring this input in the right ear, uh, and so here they are shadowing or repeating back what's happening uh, in that left ear. What they found from these tasks is that participants could report pretty minimal information about what it is they were supposed to be ignoring. That is, they were actually genuinely doing a really great job of ignoring what was being presented. So <coughs> they could report if the person speaking in the unattended channel was male or female if it was speech versus noise, that was about it. Um, wasn't really much more they were able to report beyond that in these early studies. So this led to what we call filter theories of attention. And the basic idea was that we were blocking out information in that unattended channel, paying no attention to it at all, and just simply blocking out that information. Later studies, uh, we'll see, uh, revealed that there was some information getting through, and in fact, it led to what we call attenuation theories, whereas it's not that we're completely ignoring that unattended channel, we're just turning the volume down on it. Again, this is kind of a, an old school uh, way of looking at uh, attention. It's not something I want to spend a great deal of time uh, angsting about whether or not it's filter versus atten attenuation theory, but it's worth understanding uh, where they come from. So the kinds of things that would happen uh, in the unattended channel is you would get what we call the cocktail party effect. So this is what led ne Neville Moray uh, and others to start investigating how it is that we're able to track one conversation versus the other. So this is the attentional phenomenon by which we can track one conversation among many. This allows us to attend to one message and sort of ignore others. And we use basic perceptual information to make that distinction, right? We know what our friend's voices sound like. We also know their location. So we use those two pieces of information to try to listen to one conversation versus the other. Uh, if you're like me, I do it much better if I can see the person, you know, look right at the person I'm talking to, I can actually hear them better, right? Because you can actually get some visual information about that. But subjects, uh, as Moray discovered, were able to pick out their name if it was presented in that unattended channel. And in fact, we know from sort of basic life experiences that we can pick out our name if it's said somewhere near us. Um, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but it used to be people would get paged in airports. Um, 
because nobody had cell phones. And I always thought, who would ever notice that they're being paged? Uh, until one day in the Tulsa airport, I was actually paged, and I did actually hear my name because it stands out clear as a bell. As soon as somebody over a, a, a loudspeaker is saying your name, you can usually hear it pretty well. So this sort of led people to start questioning exactly what's happening in these experiments because obviously if people were picking out their name, they weren't completely blocking out that unattended channel, and that's where we get to these attenuation theories. And there are lots of other experiments that show this. So for example, if the s message in the middle of a sentence switches to the other ear, they'll follow the meaning of the sentence to the other ear and then switch back um, kind of after a couple of words because we're using our sort of expectations about what should be coming next, so you follow the message to that unattended channel. So that basically means that while we're focusing in one area, we're probably um, not blocking out everything, but attenuating it a bit. So that's a classic approach uh, to studying some, type, some types of selective attention, particularly in auditory attention. We'll talk more about other types of selective attention here in a bit. The other area uh, that has a, a lot of research behind it is in what's called sustained attention. And sustained attention is exactly that, your ability to sustain your attention over time. And so we use what are called vigilance tasks to test this idea. And a vigilance task uh, is one in which you have to pay attention for a long period of time to a screen. And then we'll talk about how we use signal detection analysis in vigilance tasks and others uh, while we're here. And we'll talk a little bit about applications of sustained attention, for example, um, the most classic example is uh, air traffic controllers who have to pay just long periods of time sustaining their, sustaining their attention to a screen, uh, other things like train operators, over-the-road truck drivers, all these require a fairly long sustained attention. So we'll start by talking about a vigilance task, and again this refers to a person's ability to attend to an area in which a stimulus may appear uh, over long periods of time. Usually in these tasks, uh, they're fairly simple. Uh, the ones we've used in the past uh, are relatively simple. You just simply press the key whenever a lowercase letter appears. And so you get a group of letters that would appear up here, down here, over here, up in the corner, so basically in the four corners. And they would hit the space bar whenever a lowercase letter would appear. And they wouldn't appear very often. Uh, and it's a, pretty, it's a pretty boring task. Lasts about 30 minutes uh, in which about one you know, in 20 uh, stimuli will actually have something for them to do. One of the problems with this kind of long-term sustained vigilance task is over time our uh, responses start to change. And in fact, this is where a lot of the applied research has gone in vigilance tasks is in looking at people who screen uh, your luggage and your carry-on at the airport. Again, this is another sustained vigilance task. It used to be that you would put one person at that x-ray screening machine and they would sit there all day. That's what they would do all day. Now, of course, if you've ever got caught at a security screening point when they're changing positions, anyone ever had the luck of doing that where everyone has to basically play a little round robin and everyone switches from one place to the other? The reason they do that has to do with what we call signal detection analysis. So signal detection theory concerns our ability to detect, to det eh, detect the presence of a signal. So a signal can be any sort of sound, light, uh, letter in a group of distractor letters. Again, this is what we've done. Um, this can be other things like trying to find a tumor in an x-ray. Uh, it can be trying to find a gun in a bag. It can be um, trying to hear a tone. So you've all done a signal detection task, you just didn't know it. I remember in grade school when they all took you in and tested your hearing, and they beeped into each ear and you had to raise your hand each time you heard something in each ear. They still do that, right? That's a signal detection task. Basically, you raised your hand when you heard something and didn't when you didn't hear anything. So there are four possible outcomes in a signal detection task. So there are two things. There might be a signal present or no signal. 
And your response can be, yes, I heard the beep. No, I did not hear the beep, which results in four possibilities. A hit is when you correctly identify the presence of a stimulus when it's actually there. A false alarm is when you identify the presence of a stimulus when there's actually nothing there. A miss is when you miss the presence of a signal. And then a correct rejection is when you correctly say there was no signal present when there was actually no signal present. These are our four possible outcomes in this kind of signal detection analysis. From an experimental perspective, we focus almost, almost entirely on hits and false alarms. In, the, in an experimental context. Uh, the reason for that is it gives us all the information we need, and we're also comparing the same kind of response. So, for example, if we have a trial where, or a, an experiment where there's 50 items present, 50 times where there's no signal present, you hit on 49 of those and false alarm to three of those, we don't need to know what your misses are because if you hit on 49, we know you missed one. You false alarm on three, we know you correctly rejected to the other 47. So all of the information we need is contained in hits and false alarm. It also tells us mathematically some important information. So one of the things that's important in an experimental context is oftentimes we're interested in how much someone is guessing. So one of the things we can do here is we can correct for guessing. We can also determine if someone's performance is determined how, by how difficult it is to detect a stimulus and their own personal bias, which is, again, where we get into this question of guessing when we talk about their bias. So as I've said before, usually this is done you know, when detecting a signal amongst a bunch of uh, distractors or trying to hear something in a bunch of background noise or trying to see a light, something like that. In some of my research, we've done this uh, by looking at uh, memory or in recognition memory. So in a recognition memory paradigm, we present uh, a list of words, which we call old words. Uh, then in a test, they get a list of old words mixed in with new words. And then we look at the subject's response. That's old versus new. And again, we get hits and false alarms. And this is incorrect rejection. Rejection. Now, why is it important to do this kind of signal detection analysis? It's the exact same math. So both of these are the same kind of thing. You can do this also in trying to see if someone finds your gun in a bag, that sort of thing. Well, from an experimental perspective, if someone is just sitting in uh, at a computer hitting the same key over and over again, not really paying attention, they could end up with a 100% hit rate. And we would think, wow, they've really done well. well. That's all we paid attention to. But if they're just sitting there hitting the same key, they're going to end up with a 100% false alarm rate too, right? Because they're going to have just simply sat there and said the same thing over and over again. So one of the things we can do very simply is take hits minus false alarms. It's actually a pretty simple way to correct for how much someone's just guessing, wildly guessing. It also tells us a lot more about their performance because it's not just how many times they recognize an old item as being old. They're also correctly rejecting new items as new. That is, they have a low false alarm rate. So if we have somebody who has, let's say, a 90% hit rate and a 10% false alarm rate, it gives them an accuracy of between around 80% versus somebody with a 90% hit rate and a 60% false alarm rate, their performance is much lower. It's a pretty simple way to do that. Now, I want to take this one step further, talk about how we do this <coughs> a little more advanced. And again, this is a, an area that's just important for you to understand how <laughs> we can examine performance and how certain parameters can affect somebody's performance. So, we have to look at a normal curve. We're going to stick with memory just because for me it's the easiest one to talk about. 
some memory strength. You can think about it. It's easier to talk about because people know sometimes they have a strong memory versus a eh, I kind of remember. Right? That's something everybody can kind of relate to. So in an experiment, we have some distribution of memory strength of items that were presented earlier, the old items. And then new items will have much weaker memory strength, but also you know, sometimes they just seem familiar because you may have encountered them earlier in the day or some for some reason they seem familiar. <coughs> this is all done through math we won't talk about, but at some point we can mathematically determine what's called somebody's criterion. This is the point at which if a memory is stronger than that, they will say, yes, that was an item that was presented. If it's weaker than that, they will say, no, that's a new item. And of course, they don't know that they've done this, but they have some sort of criterion they set for knowing how strongly they're going to evaluate their memory. We can experimentally manipulate a lot of the parameters in this um, kind of experiment. So for example, if I pay you $2 for every hit, but it costs you $3 for every false alarm, you're going to be very conservative. So that is somebody with a liberal bias will make more false alarms, but have fewer misses. So they're going to be over here somewhere. So where they'll have higher false alarm rate, but they'll also miss you because these are misses over here. And then anything in here is a false alarm. A more conservative person will have fewer false alarms, but also will have more misses uh, because they will want a stronger memory strength. So let's go back to our airport example. One of the things that researchers determined is that over longer periods of time, people sitting at those airport screening machines developed a much more conservative criterion. That is, they missed more guns because of the longer time they had been sitting there. And the basic reason is pretty simple. If you've been sitting there not seeing guns for a long time, you don't expect to see them anymore, right? And so the less you expect to see them, the less you find them because you're just simply uh, really requiring far more information that shows you that you might have a gun in a bag. So this is a way in which this kind of signal detection analysis has important implications for things like public policy, for training. Uh, they do the same thing with uh, radiologists. So you can go through and have um, records where you know it was a cancerous, say breast cancer tumor uh, in a um, mammogram versus something that wasn't a breast cancer tumor in a mammogram. And you can go through and train uh, radiologists to be less likely to miss and more likely to find and less false alarms. So eventually you can actually train them to get better at detection. And that's a whole other parameter in this uh, we can actually mathematically determine as well. So we can determine their bias and we can also determine how good their memory is on any given occasion. <coughs> so some applications of sustained attention. Well, of course, uh, air traffic control is one of the areas in which uh, a lot of this work is has applications. Uh, military radar operators, plant operators, airport screeners. As I was saying a moment ago, studies demonstrate reduced hit rates over time. So that is, we get increased misses due to changes in bias, that changes in criterion. Training and technology can certainly assist in overcoming this kind of bias. So we're actually pretty clearly able to try to identify areas in which we can improve people's uh, signal detection ability and their sustained attention and try to avert uh, more accidents. So in areas like air traffic control, airport screeners, uh, again, things like long-haul truck drivers, uh, train operators, uh, things that require long periods of time doing the same thing, we can improve their performance by doing this kind of research. In other areas that uh, we found some interesting stuff, we found that smoking, uh, people who smoke, sorry, uh, when they are trying to quit smoking, 
had uh, much more difficulty in a sustained vigilance task, in a, this kind of sustained attention task uh, over time. Not surprising, most uh, smokers do complain of having difficulty concentrating when they're trying to quit smoking. Uh, in another uh, area we found that the higher level of uh, androgens or testosterone related hormones in postmenopausal women, uh, the worse their vigilance performance. There is some relationship between gender and attention that we'll talk about probably next time. Uh, but there is some evidence that androgens are negatively associated with sustained attention. And so we'll uh, see that when we talk about uh, the neuroscience of attention uh, probably on Monday. Any questions about sustained attention before we move into selective attention? So the dichotic listening task we talked about earlier is a form of selective attention. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, visual selective attention and a little more advanced way of thinking about selective attention. This simply refers to our ability to focus our attention on a specific object, a specific location, a specific message, or some other aspect of a stimulus. So we're selecting some subset of information out of the environment. It could be an object. It's pretty simple. If you're watching a football game, what object do you sustain your attention to? football, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of the most important part of watching a football game is being able to select out the football and watch where it goes, right? It's the reason why hockey is so hard to watch, because the puck's almost impossible to see, right? Um, so this requires an allocation of our attentional resources. This is how we allocate our attention uh, to a specific subset of the environment. So we have limited cognitive resources to allocate to tasks. Our cognitive load, then, is the amount of resources required to carry out a task. And we, of course, know that automatic tasks require fewer resources. So this is not just simply selecting things out of our environment, but also selecting you know, which tasks we might attend to. So this is a dynamic system in which we're selecting what requires our attentional resources and what we don't necessarily have to apply our attentional resources to. So one of the purposes behind selective attention is to limit cognitive load uh, and to allocate our cognitive resources so we don't exceed our cognitive load. And again, we talked about this last time. Automatic tasks, so those things that have become automatic, require fewer resources. Early on in learning, uh, before they become automatic, they often require a much higher cognitive load. So they require our cognitive resources uh, uh, to a greater extent. So we're going to take, uh, I'm going to take you through some examples of some different kinds of selective attention tasks. Um, <coughs> to give you an example, just an idea of uh, how this research occurs, we'll talk about a dichotic listening task. We've already talked about that, sorry. We'll talk about the flanker task, and we'll also talk about the Stroop task. Dichot dichotic listening tasks are auditory attention. The flanker tasks is um, based on uh, Posner's Intentional Networks, which we'll talk about, uh, I think, on Monday. This is part of what's called the Attentional Networks task. Basically, participants are instructed to pre press a key, one key when an A or a B is in the center, uh, and then press the letter M when a C or a D is here in the center, and you're supposed to pay no attention to these, what we call flankers on each side. There are three different trial types. The compatible trials are the fastest, where the response to the um, target is compatible with the response to the flanker. So you're pressing the same key when it's an A or a B. People are very fast here. Uh, when it's something completely unrelated, not quite as fast, uh, but uh, still pretty fast, these are the trials that people have difficulty on, which are the incompatible trials. There's incompatible trials where the flanker is one that requires a different response, is more difficult to ignore, and so you have to basically, it takes a little bit more time because your cognitive resources have to inhibit the response uh, of hitting the M key. So you have to not hit the M key and then hit the Z key 
and it becomes more difficult because there's this kind of competition of resources. One of the things we talked about uh, last time is that we certainly cannot uh, attend to more than one thing at a time when there is a competition of the same kind of resources. And that's what's happening here with these incompatible trials. The Stroop task is also known as the Stroop color naming task. There are a bunch of different versions of the Stroop task. This is the simplest. Um, this is an easy task to um, give to participants. You can actually just give them a sheet of paper with these on them and time them how long it takes. Uh, this would be the basic experimental condition where the participant's task is to read the color that the word is presented in. So what you have to do then is inhibit the uh, word to be presented. So in the flanker task, we're trying to inhibit these flankers and focusing on the center. That's what the selection of part of the selective attention is. In the Stroop task, we're focusing on one aspect of the same stimulus. So we have to focus on the color and ignore the word. Well, this is really easy when the two aren't incompatible, but it's much more difficult when they are uh, in conflict. So you have to read blue, okay, this is where, blue, yellow, green, yellow, red, blue, orange, I think, uh, <laughs> green, also doesn't help that I have bad color vision, blue, green, etc. It's much more difficult, and this is one of those things that gets more difficult as we get older. Uh, the Stroop task is actually a lot more difficult uh, for older adults than it is for younger adults. There are other versions of the Stroop task. This is generally a way in which we can identify how much attention uh, a task is requiring. So in the emotional Stroop task, uh, it's the same thing. You uh, read off the color of the uh, words, but instead of these being uh, color words, they are emotional versus non-emotional words, and more emotional words uh, take longer to read the color of because that highly emotional word, like murder, really captures our attention. And so it's harder to ignore those kinds of sort of threatening stimuli. Questions about that? The next area I want to talk about is uh, visual attention. start by looking at the Posner cueing paradigm. The basic idea behind the Posner cueing paradigm is um, there are three different locations, at least in the version that I've done, um, where a target might appear, no, sorry, four different locations where a target might appear. You get a cue indicating uh, in which direction the cue might appear and uh, see how long it takes uh, people to find the target. So this would be what we call an invalid cube trial. So there's normally a fixation point here at the center. People s uh, look there, then they get this cue, and then their only task in this trial is to press a button when this asterisk appears in one of these four locations. Uh, in this invalid trial, it takes people longer to find the cue than in a valid trial, which would be if the cue is pointed towards the location where the um, target would appear. 80% uh, of the trials predict the location of the queue, 20% do not. As a result, people are much more likely to rely on this queue, and so they're focusing their attention here, and it takes them much longer to find the, the target over here. There's pretty solid evidence that what's happening is we focused our attention on the location where the uh, arrow points and actively inhibited these other locations, and so you have to overcome that active inhibition to try to locate the target. Uh, this is uh, in what we call the where pathway. We're going to spend some more time talking about the what versus where pathway on Monday. There's clear evidence that uh, this seems to occur in the right uh, sort of parietal regions in this where pathway. The object orienting uh, part of our visual attention, there seems to be a distinct system for directing attention to specific objects. And we believe that's part of the what pathway. So when you're trying to select a specific object, you use a different attentional system uh, than uh, the spatial orienting kinds of visual attention, where you're lo looking at a specific location. So locations and objects are actually handled a little bit different uh, because it starts with perception, and perception has 
different what versus where pathways. We start to see how uh, the perceptual systems and the attentional networks start to work together in some of these different kinds of tasks. Any questions about kind of uh, visual attention tasks? We're going to do uh, a couple of, I'll take you through a couple of uh, demonstrations here in a bit. We're going to first talk about feature integration theory. So this is our basic um, look at spatial versus object orienting. Feature integration theory, again, extends discussions of uh, visual attention to visual search tasks, where we're scanning the environment for particular features. We actually did um, a similar kind of task in that uh, Ulrich Neisser demonstration, where you look for the Qs and the Zs. Uh, this is a little bit different uh, because we're now talking about combining different visual features instead of just one. So you're just looking for a letter in those cases. And here, uh, we're actually looking for uh, either one feature or having to combine features. And that's kind of the big difference here. So in these visual search tasks, performance depends on both the target and the background. So it's going to be a little bit similar to what we talked about with the um, feature detection theory but it's a little bit different. So here we're talking about trying to find, uh, in this particular instance, we used letters and colors. So you're finding a color of a particular, a letter of a particular color. This one's very simple. We call this a pop-out phenomenon when it sticks out like that. It just pops right out at you. A little bit more difficult, uh, but again, pretty simple because that G pops right out at you because it's so different from the Qs. It's similar, but it tends to stick out. These would be examples of single feature searches. So here we're looking for a color. Here we're looking for a letter. Very simple, very fast. So participants are particularly fast at these kinds of tasks. It starts to get more difficult when your task is to find the red G, assuming there is one. There is not one. <laughs> I'm like, that, that's the reason why there's not one to find. Is it an orange Q? Oh, there it is, yeah. The Somebody has to look for the right thing. I was looking right at it. Um, so now we have an orange cue. A little bit harder to find, obviously, because I didn't see it. Um, <coughs> so now what we have to do is actually combine two different features together. We call that a conjunction search. So a feature search occurs when you're only looking for a single feature. All we need is one, much faster. They tend to pop right out at us. We can actually search our entire visual environment for a single feature almost instantaneously. We do this all the time without thinking about it. I mean, you've been on a road trip trying to find that Starbucks logo somewhere on the side of the road. <laughs> right? Pull up, you're like, oh, there's a Starbucks here. And then you get off, and your, all your visual search is is to find that big green Starbucks logo, logo somewhere, or the you know golden arches, or whatever it is that you're looking for. It's a basic feature search task. You're looking for a single feature when it pops out. Again, we call these this kind of pop-out phenomenon. A conjunction search is required when two features must be used in conjunction with one another to detect a target. It's more difficult. We actually have to search our entire, uh, entire environment uh, and combine each element as we go along. So it requires attentional resources. The feature, res feature searches require almost no attentional resources. A conjunction search does because we have to use our attentional resources to actually combine those two features together to find what we're looking for. How many of you ever lost your car in a parking lot? Not everyone has, right? Uh, that's because <laughs> You've got to do a big conjunction search, right? You have to look for the style of car you have and the color you have, and then you have to make sure it's actually even your car. Thank God for remotes, otherwise I'd probably never find my car. Um, <coughs> another great example, how many of you have something colorful tied to your luggage so you can find it in baggage? Yeah. You were doing a feature search because you've done that so that you can, it will pop out at you and you can just find it. 
I, of course, have done no such thing. I have to use a conjunction search because my navy blue luggage that looks exactly like everyone else's ha rolls around and I have to just sort of have some idea what it looks like. Fortunately, it's fairly beat up, so I can usually find it. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is to get something to pop out at you so you can find it. Back when people actually had real antennas on their car, they would do the same thing. They would put something on the top of their antenna so they could find their own car in the parking lot. Now, of course, no one has a big giant antenna anymore. So feature integration theory then explains the ease of feature searches compared to conjunction searches. Because a feature search we can do quickly, almost entirely automatically. And here's the whole process. Each fe feature then is associated with its own sort of feature map across the visual field. So for every stimulus, the features are represented, represented, represented immediately, simultaneously, and pre-attentively. It doesn't require any of our attentional resources to search the entire visual field for that single visual feature. During a feature search, we monitor the relative map for the presence of that feature. And this can be done in parallel or all at once. The important thing about a feature search is it's independent of the size of the display. It doesn't matter how many distractors there are. As long as you're only looking for a single feature, you'll always be able to find it in the same amount of time because it pops right out at you. This is the reason why you should always have one really tall friend when you go somewhere because then you can find that one person, <laughs> right? So. Uh, one of the big conferences I go to every year for th this field is called Psychonomic Society, and my postdoc advisor, um, Elliot Hirschman, is shorter than I am. His other former student is about my height, and then there's Neil Mulligan, who's like 6'3". And so whenever we were all trying to get together to go to dinner, we would just find Neil, because he was the tallest one in the room, and then everyone else would sort of be able to find him as well. It's a basic feature search, because they just pop out, you know, stick out over the top of everyone else. So, continuing on this discussion, uh, in a conjunction search, for each object, the features must be bound together. We have to use our attentional resources to accomplish this feature binding. So feature searches, then, have to be accomplished sequentially. That is, one object at a time. You can't search an entire visual map for two features because you uh, instantly because you have to use your attentional resources to bind the features for each individual um, object. Now, usually that means you only have to search some of the objects. So, for example, if you're looking for a red G, you don't look at any of the orange objects, so you can very quickly, pre-attentively identify the objects you do need to search. Same thing you do when you're looking for your car, or if you're at the grocery store looking for uh, whatever brand of cereal you want, or mustard, whatever it is that you're looking for, right? Um, if you're looking for mustard, you just very quickly look for things that are yellow, <laughs> and then you can narrow it down to whatever it is you're looking for by using feature conjunction searches to figure out, you know, which is the French's mustard versus the Heinz, or whatever it is you like. Um, that's the basic way in which we do this kind of visual search. So something you've done, you know, you do without ever really thinking about it uh, very quickly, very rapidly. Just takes longer when you have to bind features together. So those of you who are doing interested in things like advertising, one of the things that you often get interested in is how to make your product stick out so that people can find it quickly they don't have to go searching through a myriad of options to try to find what it is that they're looking for because they can find it rapidly. And then, of course, somebody will copy your design and then make it more difficult. Okay, so we're going to switch and do a little bit of applied attention work. I may do all with my card trick. Pick a card, any card. Many of you have probably seen this on Facebook. Look, I removed your card. 
Are you amazed? No one's amazed. All right. Explain exactly what happened. Uh, if you managed to do it or not. Um, Actually, I have two things. A couple things for you to. No, we'll do these first. Explain what you believe might have happened with the card trick. That is why I was able to get rid of your card. Or just say that I'm a, you know, brilliant. because it was a question about correlation versus causation, but it was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, let's not call people names here. Um, <laughs> fraud, yes, it is fraudulent. Magic, though. Um, it is, this is actually a demonstration of what we call change blindness. So if we look back, um, So uh, they look very similar, right? But all of them actually completely change. You guys should put both of these up on Facebook and people sit there and stare at it all day and see that they completely amaze them. Um, so that's what happened with the card trick. Um, while we're here, you guys have hot, hot top. Hot back. <laughs> What's that hot topic? Um, I had a couple other discussions for you to do that are reviews from last time, so I'm going to open both of those and quick answer those while we're taking a little break. We've got a little bit of time here. <coughs> one's about blind sight, the other one's about sensory adaptation. So quick, a little bit of review. Situation. It's not sensory adaptation. Number.
So um, the biggest thing with sensory adaptation is it's not an intentional mechanism. It is a perceptual mechanism. Your senses stop responding. Uh, I was just, <laughs> funny, uh, somebody just said this thing about cloaking what you no longer notice. Uh, one of the things I think we also do is uh, if you've been sitting somebody and you're back sweating and you don't notice that until you get up and all of a sudden it's much cooler. Anyone had that happen? You know, or you take your coat off or you take your backpack off. Um, that's a form of sensory adaptation because all of a sudden the sensation changes dramatically because whatever is pressing up against your skin is no longer there. Um, in terms of blind sight, um, blind sight is that phenomenon where someone has damage to their primary visual cortex and present a stimulus there and they can actually um, report uh, that it was present uh, at a higher rate than they might you might expect from chance. So some of the things we've been talking about, uh, certainly the card trick, has to do with what we call inattentional blindness or what we call change blindness. So inattentional blindness uh, is where you just simply are focused on one aspect of a stimulus or one part of a scene uh, and don't notice the other parts of that. So it makes you blind to the other aspects of the scene. So this is the, you know, uh, the classic a girl with the umbrella that walks through the people passing the ball back and forth, or the gorilla, or the changing uh, color of the curtain behind uh, the people, uh, that you just don't notice that aspect of it because you're focused on other things. Change blindness is a very similar phenomenon where you just don't notice that a scene has changed. And that's, in fact, what that card trick is. The reason why it often works is people don't notice that you've simply changed all of the cards uh, relative to the ones that were there previously and you just deleted one card. Um, so I want to show you a couple other examples of change blindness. Um, see if we can. Anybody notice anything? Are the shirt's different? <laughs> it's a completely different guy.
into it. See? I'll have to look for it. Somehow I posted the same link twice. See this one? This one's really hard. so obvious when you see it, but I didn't see it the first time. Anybody see it the first time? A couple of you. So that's change blindness. You know, nice little fun trick you can take home with you. Um, amaze your friends with. We just simply aren't geared to pay attention to everything, and so it's the things that we pay close attention to that we're most likely to notice. So how is this all happening? Well, we think one of the things that's particularly important is uh, as we direct our attentions to objects, locations, or even different aspects of the same, same stimulus, like in the scoop task, uh, the ignored stimuli are actively inhibited. That is, we actually have an active process by which we are degrading or downplaying uh, the rest of a stimulus. And there's some really interesting um, phenomenon uh, where you can see this happening. There's this thing called negative priming, uh, which Steve Tipper uh, discovered. I don't want to get too detailed into that, but basically if you're looking at two objects and you ignore one, it's harder to recognize uh, right after that. We did a similar phenomenon with sort of objects uh, that are pretty simple. Basically you get reduced reaction times uh, based on something you've been ignoring previously. That's why it's called negative priming, because priming gives you the increased reaction time. Uh, we also see that in the spatial orienting tasks we've talked about and also in the Stroop effect. So we see this that it takes longer to process stimuli that you've been ignoring, or when you have something that's particularly difficult to ignore, like the word in the Stroop effect. So all of this is taken as evidence about how inhibition, that is inhibiting other things, is an important part of our attentional mechanism. This becomes important because as we get, things like as we get older, we oftentimes have difficulty inhibiting irrelevant information. So older adults have difficulty following a conversation in a crowded room. Um, they won't, for example, oftentimes be able to have a conversation while the TV's on because they can't ignore some stimuli. Um, the crawl across the bottom of the screen, <laughs> I discovered it's a really bad idea for older adults because my mother is unable to inhibit that. You guys know I live with my 75-year-old mother who's got dementia. Um, but she can't ignore that crawl across the screen during Good Morning America. So whatever happens during the rest of Good Morning America, she can't pay attention to because she's too busy trying to read what happened. And that asks me a question about it, and I haven't paying any attention to it. I'm like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but this is part of that. And then there's also other things where um, they have these things called garden path sentences, um, where older adults are unable to sort of inhibit uh, the alternative ending of a sentence. Uh, this also happens in memory as they're trying to search their memory for one thing. One of the important parts of memory is, uh, so your attention is used to search your memory as well. So when you're trying to search your memory for something, older adults oftentimes can't inhibit stuff that they're not searching for. 
So oftentimes you end up with information that's um, sort of overloaded. A uh, little bit about divided attention. Again, generally we're talking about task switching more than we are um, divided attention. Uh, the aim here is to explain how we can perform more than one task at a time. And again, we call this dual task performance. Our general view here is that there is a general limited pool of resources. The amount of cognitive resources required by a task really depends on how complex that task is and, of course, how automatic that task is. So we can't do more than one complex thing at a time. And we can't do anything more than one thing at a time that requires the same attentional mechanism. When we start into working memory, we'll start to see how this plays out in some working memory tasks. And we can actually see how um, when you have someone do something like say a word over and over again, it can inhibit their ability uh, to use what's called the phonological loop. And so we start to see sort of intersections between attention and uh, working memory in these kind of dual task performance uh, tasks. One of the important things I do want to talk about though is this allocation of resources. So how does we allocate our attention in this kind of multitask environment? Uh, when the pool of cognitive resources is insufficient, we have to come up with some way to allocate our attention. We kind of call this an allocation policy. So some tasks may suffer because our resources are um, elsewhere. So when we talk about these allocation policies, uh, we have what are called enduring dispositions and momentary intentions. Most of our sort of day-to-day uh, interactions are situational dis or momentary intentions. These are these situational dispositions. So dis dispositions allocate our resources depending on the situation. We also have enduring dispositions, and these are things that will always automatically capture our attention. So the automatic capturing of attention can occur for a couple of reasons. Uh, some of these built-in stimuli include uh, things like our name. So we'll automatically sort of pay attention to our name. Uh, things that are highly threatening uh, from a basic survival uh, paradigm. These tend to be things like rapidly moving stimuli. Uh, so movement's one of those things that sort of from a you know, evolutionary standpoint is more likely to be threatening. And so very loud noises, very sudden movements, unexpected noises, uh, all can uh, trigger our attention towards uh, these kind of things that will automatically capture our attention. We'll talk on uh, Monday about the different attentional networks and how uh, we actually have a sort of primal attentional network that automatically captures some of our attention. So one of the things that happens is for example, if you're walking home at night by yourself, which you of course shouldn't do, um, the things that will capture your attention will be different than they might be just in the middle of the day daytime. So noises uh, will capture your attention, movement will certainly capture your attention much more during those times. So the allocation of resources isn't always the same. So we can attend to more than one thing at a time as long as our resources are not exceeded we do know that performance on one task will decline if the pool is exceeded. We also know that the system is flexible. And the more automatic something is, the fewer resources that it requires. <coughs> so when we're talking about dividing our attention uh, between uh, tasks that require a lot of attention. Generally, we're talking about task switching. So, for example, uh, trying to text while you're driving, you're not actually doing both at the same time. You're doing one at a time uh, and just simply not paying attention to the other. Now, of course, the automatic aspects of driving you're attending to. So you've got your foot on the gas and you're still steering, generally, usually not very well. Um, but you're not paying attention to the actual very dynamic environment of driving a car. So one of the reasons why that's such a dangerous thing to do is because you have exceeded the pool of resources uh, and are really only paying attention to one thing at a time. So to finish up, I want to talk a little bit about some applications of attention. 
biggest thing is to remember that attention, like all cognitive processes, has its limits. Any additional tasks will take away resources from those other tasks. Uh, this is kind of the classic. Now, she needs to cut out a couple of these things, right? I mean, I think the phone would be the first thing to go, but then maybe we could just eat, eat, put the cup down, <laughs> something. Of course, I grew up in the 70s. It's really a miracle any of us survived. My father was one day <laughs> driving over Wolf Creek Pass in Colorado, which is an incredibly dangerous mountain pass, with a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Uh, <laughs> driving along. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that was my childhood, but I survived. Um, so if you look at uh, the data in this area, um, in sort of single task versus dual task per performance, uh, you can see this is the reaction time is much higher, um, and probability of a miss is much higher in these dual task performance uh, tasks. And these are usually done in driving simulator tasks. Uh, I also wanted to sort of talk a little bit about these kind of heads up displays. I briefly talked about these on uh, Monday. One big problem with these kinds of heads up displays has to do with, again, this problem of inattentional blindness. That is when you're focused here, you may not actually see what's happening over here. So if you're focused here on the heads up display, you actually aren't aware of the fact that you're not paying attention to what lies beyond it. Um, now, most of the modern systems that have this kind of heads up display probably also have something that will warn you that you're about to hit something. Uh, so that's where these kind of displays actually, I think, are much more useful. Um, so one of the things that uh, these kind of displays can do is that if somebody starts to run out in front of you, they can beep, alert, and also highlight something in the road. Uh, so that's where I think these kinds of systems have more benefit when they can actually help us with our um, perceptual difficulties. But displaying uh, our speedometer in front of us is just simply not uh, that important, and it's much more likely uh, to end up with some difficulties. Do you have any questions? We're done about five minutes early. Wasn't sure how long those videos and stuff would take. All right, well, again, here's some good review stuff. We're done just a few minutes early. Here's sort of all the key terms and concepts from all of the attention um, lectures I've talked about. So I always like to have those. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to see me. I'm actually going to post this.